Hey everybody, welcome back to the third episode today on uh, the 20, on the 17th of August. Uh, today we have Ron Adams with us on the Success Secrets Revealed. Uh, Ron Adams is, is an extraordinary CPA, but he has, he does so much more than that. He helps people with things like business evaluations, debt relief, and, and, and mortgage foreclosures, how to avoid all these things. So we're in for a real treat, especially in this time of financial uh, insecurity that everybody's going through. But first, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, Success Secrets Revealed, how this show came about. I have a radio show called Internet Marketing and Business Solutions with Ronald Kuhn. We have about 1.7 million reach. I've been doing the show for a little over four years now, but because of COVID, they don't man the show uh, in person anymore. You know, the station itself doesn't uh, have people there. So they're running reruns. And while those reruns were certainly all quality guests, they may not be current given the situation we're in now with COVID. So I had to pivot a little. And I started this show. I'm going to take out the audio, send it to the radio station so they can play it uh, in a rotation at a time. And then um, this, you know, video I'm just going to push out through all social media. So literally over 2 million people will easily uh, have access to um, these each one of these episodes and they're all current so uh, no guest gets paid to be on this show and no guest pays to be on this show I don't get paid to be on this show uh, this is everybody just trying to give back uh, and lastly we do have one sponsor that's my company RCS online solutions and that's where we help business owners and entrepreneurs much like you attract convert and retain their ideal customers and clients to achieve even greater success you know at the end of the day you can have the best product the best service and the best solution to somebody's problem but if they can't find you they can't serve you right so uh, you they can't even consider you rather and you can't serve them and people are searching for your products your solutions and your services they're not googling your name or your company's name. So if you Google your name or your company's name and you come up, I'm here to tell you, so what? No one's Googling that. If they know you and they know what you do, they're calling you. When they go to Google, it's because they don't know who their solution provider is, right? So you want to come up. If you're not, you contact me. I'll get you ranked on the first page often before you pay us. So enough about that. Let's introduce uh, Ron Adams. Uh, Ron Adams has prepared over 200 business enterprise evaluations and has advised numerous clients in mergers and acquisitions, asset divestures, new business planning and development, managed care contract negotiations, strategic pricing, sensitive uh, business sensitivity business valuations. He provides litigation support and expert witness testimony in major legal matters involved in business valuation, economic damages, loss of income, and compensation. He's assisted two internet based e commerce companies grow their business through an acquisition strategy. He's prepared feasibility studies for acquisitions developed financial plan structures uh, strategies and uh, a whole lot more. So let's just bring on Ron and uh, he can tell you us a little bit more. Thank Ron, you, Mr. the man with the plan. <laughs> Thanks, Ron Cooming, for having me on your great show. That was a wonderful introduction and I appreciate <laughs> your great efforts as always. Uh, thank you. Hopefully I didn't butcher it too much, brother. No, it was fine. Uh, yeah, but I've known you for seven, eight years, and you really are the go-to guy for uh, business valuations, whether it's uh, I, I, you know, doctors bringing in somebody and needing to know how much to charge them, or if they're a group of doctors or lawyers or business people and somebody wants to leave, how much do they get? You got to value your business. Uh, you know, there's a whole slew of uh, divorce cases. Uh, I, I remember you had divorce cases where both divorce attorneys uh, hired you to do an evaluation <laughs> or something. I mean, but uh, so there's no shortage of, of how you add value to people's lives. And, and I find that uh, uh, very, um, very interesting and very good because you, you're helping people on so many different levels. Uh, tell us a little bit more about who you are and what you do in your own words. 
Yeah, sure. Well, I became a certified public accountant back in uh, 1981, and I worked pretty much in the uh, public accounting arena for many years with firms like uh, Ernst & Young, Coopers & Libran, et cetera. And then in 1993, I went with a boutique consulting firm and got into business valuation for the first time. And during the next 10 years, beginning in 1993, we probably did over 600 physician practice valuations when most of the large uh, community hospitals and teaching hospitals in Boston were acquiring the primary care network physicians, including internal medicine, family practice, obstetrics and GYN, pediatrics, some surgery, but mostly the primary care physicians. And because of the regulatory situation that we were involved with, with the government and Medicare, and as it relates to Medicare fraud, there was a law called the, uh, the uh, Stark Bill, which prevented large medical centers for paying physicians more than the fair market value of their practice was worth. So as not to pay for uh, referral admissions to the hospital, et cetera. So they needed a fair market valuation conducted by an independent specialist, myself, to do that valuation to make sure they were in c compliance with stark fraud and abuse regulations in the Medicare program. So like I said, we must have worked with maybe 30 or 40 health systems, probably did over five or 600 physician practice valuations during that arena. And that was a great business for us. And uh, we really rode that crest and wave in that era, and perhaps some of you folks out there remember those days. But after that died down, and most of the physician practices that were going to be acquired got acquired, I realized that we needed to offer our services to other entities and other types of businesses instead of just strictly healthcare. So for the last 20 years, I've been doing business valuations for software companies, emerging technology companies, pharmaceutical companies, medical device companies, financial service companies, just about any kind of company that's doing business in New England, we've probably valued something in that industry. And we work with a lot of the uh, attorneys who refer a lot of business to us, including the trust and estate attorneys, you know, when uh, business owners are gifting shares in their companies to their uh, sons and daughters or heirs. Uh, they need a valuation, which has to be filed with the Internal Revenue Service, documenting the value of those uh, stocks or partnership interests or securities. And uh, we also worked with uh, a lot of the uh, family law attorneys who were servicing uh, their clients who were getting a, a divorce or going through marital dissolution where there was a family business involved. And uh, the, the attorneys would bring us in to value that family business as part of the divorce settlement process. So we did a lot of work there. In addition, we've worked with uh, corporate litigators who have uh, clients who are, you know, been economically damaged in some fashion or had a uh, event which caused loss of income. And uh, so we've done valuations to put a, a dollar value on those damages and lost income from an economic point of view. And then we've provided expert witness testimony to the various uh, courts and triers of fact in, in dealing with uh, the, those litigation uh, situations. And we've done a lot of compliance valuation work for internal revenue service related uh, tax compliance matters. But uh, we're all certified, we're all, we're all credentialed, uh, and we really take our business quite seriously. Isn't it true? I mean, that is like uh, amazing um, what you have going on. It sounds like your feedback coming. But um, uh, don't you have like this three or four certificates that you have that almost nobody else has all four? Well, um, like I said, we take this business seriously, and there are essentially four credentialing bodies in the area of business valuation. One is the American Society of Appraisers. The other one is the National Association of Certified Valuation Analysts. 
The other one is the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants, which credentials CPAs in the area of valuation. And the other one is the International Society of Business Appraisers. And I basically have all the certifications and designations from those entities, with the exception of the American Society of Appraisers. That's one out of the five that I don't have. But I figure, you know, if I get four of the other ones, uh, that's more than enough. I love it. And uh, good for you. I mean, and you run a whole gambit. I mean, you go all the way back to the 80s. I mean, uh, you're looking like you're about 29 here. I mean, but uh, yeah. I wish. <laughs> <laughs> but your history is like uh, Ernest and I mean, with some of the biggest firms out there. So uh, even though you have your own company now and, and you are doing your own thing now, you have worked with some of the best in the business and the biggest in the in what some people might say the brightest, huh? Yeah, we've worked with the publicly traded companies, including General Electric, Raytheon, uh, some of the big ones, Gillette, and also Ocean Spray. Uh, but also we work with, you know, the mom and pop type businesses uh, that are selling pizza or doing uh, heating, ventilation, air conditioning contractors, construction trade individuals. Uh, you know, if, if they're selling a service or a product, and they're generating uh, cash flow, we can put a value on them. I love it. And it's so important to have that value. If they're looking to sell their business, to grow their business, to get a loan, uh, you know, a line of credit. I mean, there could be any a host of reasons why people might need a business evaluation. Yeah, especially nowadays with the Small Business Administration is stepping into the maybe the, the, uh, the financing uh, arena providing financing for small businesses, especially in this situation of COVID and that sort of thing where the economy has been uh, somewhat shut down and companies need uh, financing to carry them through so they can uh, continue to pay their employees, maintain their employees on payroll and continue to strive to be successful in the future. So uh, we do uh, valuations to obtain uh, bank and SBA financing as well to help our uh, our business folks out there. Now that has to be big demand right now because that EDIL or whatever it's called, uh, I think that's might be even running out. But there, you know, people are uh, they definitely need that. Oh, the PPT, PPP, PPP right? which is Paycheck Protection uh, uh, Program. They call right. it the PPP loan program, and the other one is the Economic Injury and Damages Loan. Uh, which has, you know, very attractive interest rates, long amortization periods. And uh, for example, the uh, economic injury damages uh, loan, uh, if you were to take that out in June or July or August of uh, 2020, the, pay the repayment uh, schedule doesn't really take effect until July of 2021. So, the, you know, the government's striving to give uh, the businessman a chance to get up on their feet get back in the game, start servicing their clients, and continue to uh, do business. That's excellent. And they certainly need that assistance right now because there's so many businesses that are either. I mean, right now I saw that it said 40% of all small businesses have literally shut their doors, 40%. Now, uh, to me, that that's a staggering number. I, I don't know if that means that they've shut them and they're not opening again or if they've shut them as a result and they're, you know, some of them are going to come back. But uh, we got we got generational uh, damage being done uh, to these businesses right now. I mean, it's staggering. So hopefully some of these loan programs will keep people afloat until things can just stabilize a little bit, you know? Yeah, a lot of businesses are family uh, created and maintained businesses. And uh, this, this whole uh, scenario that we've witnessed since February has really hurt them really bad. And I've been coaching my clients to hang in there do whatever you have to do to increase your business, be more uh, customer sensitive, you know, stick together on this and stay in the game and keep your business going. I love it. And uh, so what are some things people can do if they wanted to actually, uh, can you tell us the difference between the PPP, the EIDL, and uh, if, if they're still available and what people could do to apply for them, including maybe get an evaluation? Yeah. The uh, PPP, the Paycheck Protection Plan, is essentially 
uh, a loan from through the Small Business Administration. And uh, it's basically a loan in terms of size. I think it's two and a half months worth of uh, monthly uh, payroll that you might have with your employees. And what the government's trying to do there is throw you a lifeline to, even though your business may be shut down temporarily, uh, you can maintain your work staff and not lose them because one of your most valuable assets in your business is your in-place works force. So you want to maintain those folks, keep them on the payroll, and this PPP or Paycheck Protection Plan loan is a way to do that, and the, uh, and you, and the SBA has made those funds available. Uh, it's a fairly uh, complicated uh an involved process to get that forgiven, but you know, talk to your accountants and your CPAs or your lawyers to see if they can help you do that and get that uh, loan forgiven and converted to a grant so that you don't have to pay it back. But you have to reach out to your financial advisors and legal advisors to make sure you do it correctly. Yeah, you definitely don't want to run afoul of, uh, you know, of that because uh, I heard too that if you get like the um, E I D L or whatever it is, it's the uh, economic it, injury damages loan. Yeah, if you get that, there are certain things that you can use that for, and if you don't, they could come back and uh, make you pay one and a half. So if they gave you twenty grand, you might have to give them fifty. You know what I mean? So yeah, you just have to read the instructions and how to spend it. You know, it's if it's business related, you can certainly do that. And uh, right now, you will have to pay that back, but they're giving you a one-year grace period before you have to make uh, payments. And it's usually, I think, a 30-year amortization on that. Now, let me ask you this question on that. That's a great point. Um, if somebody got a 30-year amortization, right? Let's say they got 10 grand for round, round numbers, uh, and they say, okay, you have to give us $55 for the next 30 years to pay that back. If you do the math on that, they're probably paying close to twenty grand back, so or or seventeen thousand, right? So if they actually did that, they'd be paying almost like fifty percent, which is you know that's how people don't realize it. That's how mortgages work too. You really get juiced. But um, if they paid that back, uh, you know, like let's say they paid a thousand or, or three hundred a month. And would they still be required to pay back that total amount of seventeen thousand with all that interest? Because initially it was thirty years. Even if they pay it back early, they're still on the hook for all that interest. Or is all that interest only for how many months the money is outstanding? Yeah, uh, it'll be basically whatever you draw down on that loan. It's going to be, I think the interest rate is like 3.75%. So there, and that's fixed for 30 years. I'm not sure any banks are lending 30 year money for 3.75%. That's fairly uh, economically uh, beneficial interest rate. And you will be able to deduct the interest as a taxable, taxable expense and therefore a deduction from your income. So there is a benefit there. So let's say you took out $100,000. I think that works out to paying back $440 a month starting in July, let's say, of 2021. So it's really a little bit more than the cost of a, a cell phone and an internet connection if you if you use a lot of that in your right. business. But that's not too bad. I mean, I think that's very effective myself. I own a yeah, it, and you can only it off. Yeah, but my question is, right? Yeah, but my question is now. Let's say it is for round numbers five hundred a month, right? And you borrowed a hundred thousand. It's five hundred a month for thirty years. That five hundred a month is six thousand a year, times ten is is uh, sixty thousand times, uh, you know, double that. There's a hundred and eighty thousand. So you've paid eighty thousand in interest. So you've got a hundred if you pay it back 500 a month over time you're going to pay back 180. if you pay down that principal sooner can you get less than 180 or is it once you get that it's flat you got to pay that amount even if you pay it off quicker no if you pay it off that debt is gone the interest is gone with it if you pay back the principal 
Okay, so it's only the interest on what you owe. It's not your That's lock correct. into. That's correct. Yeah. And once again, just remind you, Ronnie, that uh, that is tax deductible. So if whatever your marginal tax rate is, the cost of that interest is really, you know, three point seven five percent less the tax effect. So it could be worth uh, less than two less than. Uh, it could be as low as 2% effective tax uh, interest rate on that loan after tax uh, shields. Yeah, good stuff. And uh, so good. All right. So now tell us if, let's say somebody can't get a loan and they are heavily in debt. I mean, what are some options that people have uh, to help reduce or put off? I've, I've heard of things called forbearance. I've heard of, yeah. You know, uh, so, so what are the options that people have? Yeah, the government has, you know, basically given people on their mortgages, for example, they gave them a 90 day forbearance on paying the principal and interest on their mortgage payments or college loans uh, to give people some breathing room because, you know, if, if they're, if the business has been shut down and people can't work, there's no income coming in, so how can they pay their uh, their debt service and loans back? They can't. That's the honest to God truth. Uh, and originally, some of those loans were after the 90 day period, which ended uh, August 1st. They were expected to pay back either the delinquent rents or the debt payments in a lump sum payment. And that was kind of uh, an arduous uh, requirement or mandate because if you're not working, you don't have any money coming in. And how can you pay, you know, one month's uh, debt service or rent if you don't have any income coming in? And now you're expected to pay four or five months catch up altogether. So uh, some of the states have added another. 90 days on to the forbearance period just to uh, see if we can get this economy straightened out, get people back to work, earning money and uh, being able to pay their bills, including their debt. Uh, All right. So, um, so that's great. Now that's about the forbearance, but what about, uh, what if people are just, they, they just can't do it. They owe 200,000, a hundred thousand and, uh, you know, is, is there options like bankruptcy or other things that uh, people can consider? And what are some of the ramifications of going that route? Yeah, um, obviously, there. You know, if people just can't pay their debts and they're looking to discharge their debts in a bankruptcy proceeding, they can certainly do that. They're going to have to retain a bankruptcy attorney to uh, help them through their process, and. Uh, while they may be able to discharge their debts through a bankruptcy proceeding, you know, you, you might have to end up selling assets uh, to obtain proceeds to then pay off the uh, creditors or lenders. Uh, it might be paying them off uh, 40 cents on a dollar, 10 cents on a dollar, 60 cents on a dollar, depending on what your situation is. Everybody's different. Uh, We've kind of developed an approach that sort of is an alternative to bankruptcy, and I call it the debt remediation process. And uh, that's a process whereby through a non-judicial, you don't go to court, this is a strictly administrative process, where you begin to send letters to your lenders, or alleged lenders in some cases, or loan services, and basically ask them to provide proof of their claim to show proof that you in effect owe this alleged lender the money that you borrowed way back when. And that could be credit card debt. It could be an auto loan. It could be a college loan. It could be a mortgage. But the lender under the Truth in Lending Act and the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, which were instituted during the 70s and 90s to protect borrowers, the lenders are required to show proof of their claim against you. Now, I've been working in this area since 2010, after the meltdown, the financial meltdown in 2008, and I've helped a number of people 
in similar situations. We've all been in that situation one time or another uh, with uh, unserviceable credit card debt and debt and other situations. And there is a way to challenge the uh, lender or the alleged lender to prove their case without going to court. And that's very important because once you go to court, you're going to have legal expense, court costs, etc. So my approach with Foxborough Consulting Group is to use this uh, debt remediation process and in some, time, in some cases negotiate with the lender in the 10th or 11th hour to reduce the amount of the loan from, let's say, $10,000 down to $1,500. And the banks and the lenders are, are business people, and they're looking to make a deal and to collect something instead of going through a long, legal, arduous process to collect something more than something. Right. For example, on the $10,000 uh, loan. Chances are there's no money to be had anyhow. So if they can get 1500 today, why yeah. you spend, you know, three, you're going to spend 30 grand on an attorney and four years from now, you know, you're going to get 800. Yeah. So in order to mitigate everyone's losses, it's better to take some money today, right off the rest of the debt, discharge it. And the lender gets some funds and the borrower, you know, eliminates $8,500 worth of debt on a $10,000 loan. So, I mean, they get some relief without having to go through bankruptcy, which could affect your ability to borrow from seven to 10 years. Whereas the non-judicial debt remediation process prevents bankruptcy and saves your FICO score. I love it. I love it. And that's something that people really need to think about. So now if somebody's um, looking to start a business, uh, would you suggest that they uh, hire someone like you or yourself specifically just so they know that they have all their uh, corporations, LLC, whatever it is in their tax structure? Because, you know, you can be an LLC, but be a C Corp or an S Corp. Uh, or a partnership. Or a partnership. And, you know, all those have different um, uh, tax tax uh, advantages, disadvantages, and requirements. So for somebody who might be starting a business, they really should consult someone like you before they even start the business or soon after because they want to make sure they get the structure right to protect themselves, right? Right, right. And there are different kinds of structures, as you alluded to, uh, to set up. You know, the first thing you want to do is get a EIN number from the IRS. So you have a uh, IRS number. An EIN is similar to a social security number, but it relates more to a uh, business. And you fill out an SS4 form to make that application for the EIN number. And then you really need to talk to an expert or a specialist in terms of what kind of entity you want to uh, form. Do you want to operate under a sole proprietorship where you might be uh, more, there might be more risk of uh, litigation and lawsuits against you and where they can attach personal assets? Or do you want to shield yourself using a corporation or perhaps a limited liability company or a partnership if you have a number of people that want to go into business with you? But all of that, all of that type, those types of decisions have to be looked at individually on a person by person basis because everybody has some idiosyncrasies and uh, specifics that need to be looked at. I love it. And it's so important. It's not just about how much money you make. It's about how much you get to keep at the end of the day, right? That's right. We all have families and bills that we have to take care of. Do we not, Ronnie? No, I agree with you 100%. And you have a legal duty and a moral legal obligation to pay your taxes, but you don't have to pay a penny more than you owe. Am I correct? Just your fair share. <laughs> And is that a subjective or objective question? What is your fair share? Whatever the law says it is, right? Exactly. Exactly. It's a great country we live in here in the United States. And uh, taxes is part of that equation. And uh, taxes help a lot of different people and a lot of different things that we need for services. Right. You have so many different areas of, of, of expertise. My suggestion would be somebody reach out to you. 
uh, and uh, you know just explain whatever their current situation is, and then maybe you can uh, just let them know the different uh, ways that you'll be able to help them because you know it does if they already have a business if they're going to start a business if they're going to retirement i mean you you're the whole gambit so uh, how can somebody reach you if, if they wanted to either call you or uh email you yeah i mean you can find us on the web at www.foxborough f-o-x-b-o-r-o hyphen consulting.com and our phone number is 774-719-2236. Well, let me repeat that. That's 774-719-2236. And I answer the phone myself. And, uh, you know, the first phone call is always free. And I'm glad to chat with you. And uh, I love my fellow Americans. And I'm always willing to lend an ear and hear what their issues are and see if I can provide some uh, beneficial advice. I love it. And, it. and it's best to get that advice before you actually need it. So if you're going to start a company, get it, you know, the formation, find out what's the best formation for you before you actually start it. Uh, if you already have a company, if you're looking to get loans, if you're looking to sell your business or whatever the case may be, you know, call someone, call Ron Adams at foxborough-consultant.com or someone like him, uh, you know, because it's going to cost you so much more if you make a mistake. You know what I mean? Let me just add to that, Ronnie. If you're going to uh, form a partnership or a corporation, it's very important. And I've got to say this five times. It's very important to get in place a shareholder agreement if you're a corporation or a partnership agreement or a membership agreement if you're a partnership or a limited liability company. You need those documents in place before you open the door for the first customer. Those documents have to be in place because if you're in business and you have partners or shareholders and you don't agree to get a divorce or split up the corporation, it makes it very expensive to do that if you don't have those agreements in place beforehand. So you need to call your attorney or your CPA to make sure you get that in place. I can't tell you how many times I've been in litigation type uh, engagements where there were no documents in place and the legal costs and the cost of the litigation was like two or three times more than it had to be. Exactly. I can see that happening. Somebody, you know, it might cost you 500, 1500 bucks to, to get it drawn up and drawn up right. Uh, or, you know, I mean, just that's like, you know, between if two people are, are both have to hire attorneys and they're fighting the time they're in court, attorney costs, you're looking at probably eight to 10 grand each. A hundred thousand, try a hundred thousand. Yeah, I mean, it's crazy. <laughs> so definitely get it all done right at the beginning. Do it right the first time, right, Ronnie? Exactly. Exactly. Get it done right. And, uh, you know, we're going to be talking more about the whole debt reduction uh, project that uh, Ron has going on. It's truly a phenomenal uh, thing for people. But we're going to we're going to put that on an entire episode by itself so people can fully understand it. I just wanted you people get to meet Ron now, see who he is. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of things he does on an individual basis that will really, really help you both personally and professionally. So I want to thank you, Ron. Is there anything in closing you'd like to say? Well, you know, just, just generally speaking, you know, during the uh, COVID situation from February through the current period, we've seen a lot of our fellow Americans lose their jobs. And there's some questions as to whether or not some of these folks are going to have a, a job to go back to. And I know they're struggling with debt and mortgages. So, this debt remediation program is going to be very important for a lot of people to get involved with in order to deal with this uh, horrendous situation. But we've yeah. got we've got the tools and the process to uh, end up with a beneficial uh, outcome for you, a lot of people. I love it. And we'll be talking more about that later, putting together a whole program for uh, people and stuff. And uh, Ron, always good uh, listening to you, talking to you. We've been friends. I've been working on your stuff for, I don't know, eight or nine years now. Uh, you're a great guy. I, I you highly, made me the man I am today. I highly recommend uh, people uh, reach out to you. All right, Ron, we'll talk later, brother.
Thank you.